Bon, bonjour à tous et merci beaucoup d'être venu à cette dernière séance de notre projet. Eh, un gusto hoy, es que el casco, el proyecto AREN, es que ensayará el Torcha Gatic. Eh, buenos días a todos y gracias por haber venido a la última sesión de nuestro proyecto. Unfortunately, not everyone in this room uh, speaks the three main languages, the, th the three official languages of the, of the project, eh, Basque, Español eh, o... Oh, French. So we are going to use a, we are going to use a lingua franca, English. Unfortunately, we are going to speak in English. Okay. Well. Uh, so today we have a nice session devoted for for additive manufacturing in the aerospace sector. Okay. F uh, firstly, we will have an, an introductory technical talk uh, given by our host, Nitec, about printed electronics. Then we will have the, the final session with the, with the results of the project. This is a spoiler, impressive and positive. Okay, so we are very glad to, to have this final session because the, proje the project has, gone, has, got a lot, uh, has got a lot of run to, uh, to go and a lot of future. Okay? Uh, the leader, Andral, will conduct the presentation The partners will, will, will be seated there, and we, they uh, give uh, uh, little speeches about their, the, fa the faces performed and, the, well, and present themselves. Okay? Um, finally, uh, I think Nine will give a little, a little talk about the, about, the, about the Euro region and about the just five minutes. And I think someone from the Navarra government will come, but I don't know, okay? Then a snack, and, and we, we will have a little networking there. Uh, Ushua, it's your turn. Good morning, everyone. Bonjour, Egunon. Buenos dias a todos. First of all, thank you for the organization to organize this final session of the Valid and Tennis project. Uh, I'm Ushua Perer de la Raya, Research and Project Manager at Nitec, and I will be in charge of giving this introductory session about printed electronics, uh, the integration of printed electronics in composites, and in particular for uh, application in the aeronautics sector. Mm, uh, I may suppose that you know a little bit about NITEC and later on my colleague Tasio will explain briefly our lines of work, but uh, I will give you some small data. NITEC is a technological center specialized in mobility and mechatronics. Uh, we aim to be a reference of excellence in sustainable and mobility and mechatronics in the international of international reference okay uh, although nitec has born in 2018 uh, this technological center has an exp extensive experience of more than 30 years where giving providing services and giving innovative solutions to different sectors but under other names the last one Cemitec and cetena that may sound to you We are a team of 75 uh, professionals in, of an average experience of 15 years and a percentage of doctor uh, close to 30%. Uh, we have three locations. Uh, the first one is the central headquarters in Pamplona, here where we are now. Uh, the second one is Noain, where we have all the material labs regarding to metallic and polymeric uh, um, testing and also the team working on electronics mainly. And the third building that is in Estella Lizarra, where we have the differential equipment, uh, printing equipment. Okay, and now always also our laboratory, logistic laboratory, in which we can perform different drones, uh, um, tests, and so on. Okay, as um, you may know, okay, composite material were a revolution in the aerospace uh, sector, and now they are entering strongly in other sectors in the recent years. Uh, its main advantage is the weight reduction, thanks to the mechanical performance. Um, in the last year, of course, the manufacturing process uh, has been developed, moving from very manual handling to more advanced monitor and, and more efficient manufacturing. 
Uh, and a lot of work has also been done um, related to, to the material itself. But returning to the challenge of weight reduction, to the lightness necessary to the new mobility, uh, we have to say that not only structural components need to, to have this reduction of weight, but also other complementary elements, auxiliary elements such as uh, electronics, wiring, uh, energy storage solution and so on can um, contribute to, to, to have this weight reduction. And in this term, printed electronics can offer good solution in order to achieve this uh, lightness and weight reduction. Okay, in this introductory presentation, I will try to explain what is, uh, what is printed electronic, what is, um, what is for, where we can apply it, when we can apply it, and at the end, the reasons and the, the advantages that uh, this uh, new technology or already established technology but not exploited technology can be used in the uh, aerospace sector. Okay, at the end of the presentation, I will uh, present to uh, four uh, different examples. The first one uh, was uh, developed in the IMUF uh, project. It's a Cervera uh, project in which we, ca we are replacing some wiring in drones application uh, by printed electronics. The second example that we will present is uh, printed heaters for anti-aging application or even thermal comfort uh, application. The third one is related with connectivity, that we are also introducing antennas in, in the intermediate layers of the composite materials. And the fourth uh, example is related with the development of strain gauges that we have developed, also printed and introduced in composite materials uh, for the monetization of the structural health of the material. Okay. Um, the first thing, what and why and, and what is for printed electronic? What is printed electronic? Okay, we can call printed electronic to the, the manufacturing by printing of conventional electronics in, with conventional printing technologies. Okay, this allows us, among others, to provide other uh, functionalities different to the one that the product itself has. Um, the use of traditional technologies uh, in combination with advanced materials he gives this opportunity, gives the opportunity to, inter to introduce a conductive paths, a resistive paths, or bioactive inks, or sensitive inks that can give us new functionality in the product. And as the technologies that we are using are traditional and well established in the market uh, and they are also um, ma uh, has a massive production we can also uh, achieve low cost pr uh, products okay uh, and what it's for um, we can replace existing devices with less complex uh, printed ones antennas or lightings for example we can improve existing products, reduce the cost or improve performance or give to them flexibility. In the image we can see, for example, some heaters that uh, are rigid, but if we can print them in a textile or in a flexible film, we can <laughs> get like flexible uh, heaters or flexible printed thermoelectrics. And we can also, this technology can give us the opportunity to think about disruptive concepts uh, that arise in new products, uh, complete solution in, uh, using this uh, printing technology um, for many different applications. In the image we have there, for example, some electrodes for uh, glucose systems uh, sensing that are uh, manufacturing by printed. Uh, when we talk about printed electronics, we are talking about as I said before, printed wiring, printed sector sensors, uh, printed lighting, 
printing electrodes or even keyboards or antennas or sliders or flexible thermoelectrics, uh, heaters, electron luminescence. Um, I don't see <laughs> I have more images there. Uh, in Nitec, here we have different all these different uh, pictures there with added functionalities, as I said before, lightness, uh, improved products at the end. Uh, the process of developing printed electronics is defined in three steps. The first one, the product and also the process has to be defined. Uh, so we start by the definition of the specification. We select the printed materials. Of course, we have to select the manufacturing process. We have to define the materials that we are going to use in this process. Uh, and it's ne if it's necessary, we also de uh, design and, and, and define the control electronics uh, via simulation or, or development of the hardware of these uh, electronics. Then uh, we move to the manufacturing phase. Uh, in which, if necessary, we need to formulate the functional inks, we need to establish the printing uh, condition, and we have to sometimes to integrate other components that are not only printed but also incorporated in the manufacturing processes. And then we move to the verification step where mechanical and functional validation is carried out, uh, and if necessary, of course, the industrialization support is given by, by the expert. In the development of printed electronics, and therefore also in their application in the composite uh, materials and aeronautics sector, many factors have to be taken into account. The first group of factors is the, what uh, is taken into account for, related with the manufacturing process. Of course, we have to, to consider the technology, the material, the substrates that we are using and the uh, curing conditions that will be applied during this manufacturing process. And of course, we have to take also into account the use, the condition of use, the operating conditions and the design. And also, and, and very uh, important to, the, to achieve the sustainability of the new um, products developed is the life cycle. So we have to take into account raw material and possible recyclability of these uh, printed electronics. Uh, related with the uh, factors uh, related with the um, manufacturing, uh, we have to select the technologies depending on the speed of the production needed. Of course, depending on the application of the final product, the resolution needed for the specific design. We have to take into account the inks. Uh, as per related with the cost of the inks, so the commercial uh, availability of the inks, the rheological processes, uh, properties needed for the process and the nature, so the compatibility in the ink substrates and the application needs to take into account. Uh, we also select the substrate. If it's, for example, the composite, we have to select correctly the textile, the fi carbon fiber, the gla glass fiber, or even bales or membranes that will be used to, to incorporate these uh, printed electronics. Uh, we have to take into account the nature of this nature uh, to achieve a good interaction with the inks, good porosity to permit the, the, the composite from manufacturing, or of course the, the mechanical properties that, that will be needed at the, at the end of the product. And of course, aspects related with the curing, if it's thermal, UV, or infrared uh, curing. And related with the uh, condition of use, uh, they have to take uh, considering in the <laughs> at the very beginning uh, first step in the design of the electronics. What is the functionality we want to achieve? Uh, what are the conditions of use? And what is the target price? <laughs> uh, of course operating condition in this term also uh, taking into account regulations and standards very important in the se sectors we used to work and other uh, restrictions that the sector could could have and as I said before this life cycle aspects related with the raw material the proximity the recyclability of the energy consumption during the manufacturing and the use has to be also uh, considered at that point, I will. I would like to highlight the path of printed electronics at Nitec in the recent years. 
We have been working on this technology for more than 15 years. We were one of the first ones working in, on that. We started in 2004 uh, with um, well, the production of our first printed circuit prototypes. In 2010, we launched our first spin-off for the commercialization of inject printing, printing solution. Um, and at that time, we realized uh, about the lack of commercial inks for printed electronics. So it was the technology was there, but we couldn't find a good conductive uh, ink, or resistive, or insulating, or they were very low availability, high price, or whatever. So we start working on the um, production and, and development of our own inks. Uh, and in 2017, we launched our second uh, spin-off, uh, Mate Prinks. And since 2019, we have been focusing more on the technologies, you know, in mold electronics, for example, the bed composite with, uh, print, uh, with uh, different technologies, and also in other uh, technologies such as leaf, or laser, laser transfer and in mold mainly. Uh, finally, in this forum, I wanted to also to highlight that NITEC, as, as a European reference in printed electronics, we participate in the uh, committees for the standardization of the printed electronics, uh, in particular in this TC uh, 119. Uh, this standardization committee work in the development of new standards. We have already developed more than 32 laws or regulations to, um, <laughs> to be able to prove that the printed electronic can be applied in first sector to establish the way of validation of these printed electronics. And for in September, we will have the honor to, to host here in Pamplona the European uh, Conference for the Standardization of printed electronics after two, two trials in 2019 and 2022. I know uh, because of COVID uh, problems, we could not uh, uh, organize. Okay, moving on the part of these electronics on composite and in, on, on aeronautic uh, sector, uh, where uh, we have to answer where with these printed electronics can be applied. Uh, it's true that at the beginning we start to print on thermoplastic parts. Uh, for that uh, purpose, we develop a robotic arm with an inject heat, uh, head and we print on that. But is this something, let's say, conventional that <laughs> many people were working on that? So uh, then we move to, to integrate these electronics on thermosetting and not only on the surface, but also in the inner layers of the composite that can allow us some different advantages. Uh, in this regard, we are working in three integration st strategies that uh, its application depend on the um, sector and on the manufacturing process. We work on direct printing, uh, direct printing on the surface of the um, components materials. We also work on the integration in the inner layer, it's a more challenging one because we need some protection of the uh, electronics. Uh, and we also work on the uh, in, um, embedding the electronics on during the manufacturing processes in external layers. Uh, here, for example, for the surface printing, uh, we have a, a drone platform in which we have print some uh, wiring uh, by a screen printing. It's a uh, 2D piece, so it's uh, easy to print it with uh, conventional uh, technologies. Here, the substrate with the printed electronic is print is, <laughs> is the final product. Uh, we don't have um, some any limit, major limitation in terms of the inks, since we can uh, use most of them, and this strategy has the advantage that we have access for the reparation. That is also important. So, uh, for example, for the aeronautic sector is one of the strategies that we are using. Uh, another strategy is the integration in the inner layer of the composites. Uh, as, I as I said before, we are using 
um, let's say, carrier textiles in which we introduce the printed electronics, for example, our heater, and then this uh, carrier substrate is integrated in the, in the composite. The inks used here must uh, withstand the manufacturing processes, so they have to support the pressure uh, processes or pressure step, temperature step, and so on. Uh, and for example, in this sense, the elasticity of the inks is crucial to maintain the conductivity after the process. Uh, here, of course, the protection of the electronics is uh, very important. Uh, we have, for example, camphor fiber that is conductive, so we have to protect very <laughs> properly the, the electronics in order to, to, to maintain its functionality. Uh, and, for example, uh, in the sense uh, we are working in the wind energy sector, we where the um, mechanical properties are not such as crucial. Uh, this is important because when we introduce the uh, printed electronics in the inner layer, they can act, uh, uh, act as a defect. So we have to work on the design to compensate this possible uh, disruption. Uh, and the third uh, strategy is to uh, incorporate the printed electronic on the surface in during the manufacturing. This is called, for example, such as in model electronics or via additivation of the of the of the components. Uh, here, the substrate could be whatever, and then we have not a big limitation in terms of inks, possible sectors automotion here. So here, a comparative all of them. And at that point, I will show the, how we do the integration of this uh, um, printed electronic in composite, how it's implemented in the different projects. We start by the design of the electronics. We select the printed method. We select the materials, the condition. We characterize the printing. <coughs> we integrate the elements, and then we do the functional characterization. Regarding the design, we take into account uh, uh, we work on the with the people, the uh, more electronic profiles working on the design. The, um, they do the determination of the ta uh, track width parameters according to the layer resistivity and the inks that are used. Um, they work on the um, product design. Uh, we also work on the preparation of the printing tools. And then we think about the connection. That is also very challenging. The, the printed electronic uh, does not end when the printed is <laughs> finished. But we also need the connection between this printed uh, step uh, with the commercial, uh, conventional electronics. So uh, after that, we select the printed method. Uh, for that, um, I don't know how you are you how much you are used to electron to printing technologies that we have like let's say two groups can be digital or non digital printing technology and we work in we can work in roll to roll process or seat to seat um, in the non-digital technologies, uh, we introduced the gravure, flexography, uh, offset, and screen printing mainly. And within digital technology, the best known is inject technologies. Um, but uh, we have now always other such as lift, laser infused uh, forward transfer. Uh, digital technologies allow printing without tools, without any cliché or a screen or whatever. So um, the changes are fast. Mm, and they are very versatile technologies that can allow instant and design changes. But on the contrary, the printing speeds are very low. Uh, this makes that for large, large printing grants or um, large production, uh, the, the non-digital technology are still more spread. Uh, here are the three examples of non-digital technology. Gravure is a direct printing system for flexible substrates mainly. Uh, the second one is uh, flexographic. It's an indirect uh, printing because the ink goes 
to a second role before uh, being transferred to the substrate. And the third one is the offset, very used for um, paper printing. Regarding, this is the, uh, the fourth non-digital technology, screen printing. Uh, in this sense, we have a mess in which the ink pass through where the um, printing uh, patterns are not uh, fixed. And moving to the digital technology, uh, we have the best known technology, inject, inject technology. Uh, this is on one example of the machine we have in Estella. We have different platforms, but this is mm, the most uh, conventional one. In this case, the image is formed by the, com the deposition of ink, dr ink drops. Uh, and in the right side, we have uh, the l another technology, lift, laser induced forward transfer. And in this case, the material is deposited in, in, the, in the substrate um, by a donor material uh, when a laser beam is, uh, is, uh, is promote the liberation of the material. And final mention the issue of the rotary printing. This is the pilot plan we, uh, that NITEC has in Estella. Uh, it's a very versatile machine in which we can print and configure the process uh, with different printing technology, different curing. So at the end, we can achieve a role in which all the <laughs> wiring is printed or sensors are printed. So very, it's very, very useful. And we can configure, we can move the modules. And, and at the end, has a, 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 an industrial environment, a pre-industrial environment in, in our facility to produce all these printed electronics. And moving, moving, uh, moving forward in this process, uh, once the printing process has been selected, the technology, we have to work on the material selection. selection. Uh, when selecting the inks, we have to take into account, first and most important, the functionality we need for uh, these inks. If they have to be conductive, persistive, sensing, uh, insulating, uh, weldable, or whatever. Uh, we have to take into account also the granulometry of the inks, depending on the printing technology that it has uh, been selected. The rheology, for example, for screen printing or offset, the inks are totally different. The rheology of these inks are indifferent. And also the curing uh, aspects of the inks and others, such as uh, if the elasticity of the inks is necessary, of the sustainability, of it has to be pre-approved uh, or pre-certificate to different sectors has also to, to be considered. Although more and more inks for printed electronics are available in the market, it's true that sometimes it's difficult to find materials that meet all the requirements, not only for the final product, but also for the uh, printing process. For the integration of printed electronics, for example, in ITEC, we have um, formulated some inks, uh, in this sense, uh, stretchable inks. For example, here we have the commercial ones, usually cracks when we apply the composite process. So we need the inks very stretchable. With a, so we have been working on that, selecting the particles, maybe not spherical particles, but, but plateless that will allow us this elasticity. We work on the dispersion of these uh, additives. We, we characterize them and, and we prove that the ink is going to be behave properly in the process. As I mentioned before, it was also necessary to prepare the tools for the printing. Example, any logs for graveware, eclipses for flexography, or even uh, screens for uh, screen printing. And selecting that is also uh, tricky in terms of parameters that will affect in the final, to the final uh, design. The ne next step is to define the printing condition. Very briefly, uh, sometimes it's necessary to pre-treat the substrate, 
in case of composite materials, if the carrier is a plastic or textile, maybe we have to reduce porosity, maybe we have to increase the um, um, energy, the surface, surface energy or whatever. We, it's necessary to have some clean steps of the substrate of the final product that has to be uh, print to see, printed. Uh, we have to do some registration of the different layers because uh, when we are doing this development, <laughs> uh, the component has not only one printed layer, but we have some combination of components, layer, and so on. Uh, we have to establish the different parameters of printing and, and so on. After that, it's very important to prove that the printed paths are cor uh, correctly um, applied. Uh, we carry out topography and morphology tests. Uh, it's important to prove also a correct adherence of the inks uh, to the substrate to avoid detachments. We also character do thickness measurement, roughness analysis, the measurement, for example, of the layer resistance or the resistivity in the conductive layers or um, electrical insulation or the electric st strength in the insulating layers. And then we do the integration. Uh, as the most critical strategy in the integration process is the, uh, the integration in the intermediate layers carry out, uh, we are using manual laminating or infusion to, to do this integration. And uh, we face two main challenges. The first one is the printing, but we are supposed to be <coughs> expert on that, so it's not a, a big one. Uh, the second one, very important on this application, is the electrical insulation. Uh, carbon fiber is conductive, we, we need a good insulation, but we are working on that with different materials, resin and so on, and the pro results are quite promising. Uh, we also need a good integration in order to uh, um, to achieve that the electric, the printed electronic uh, don't behave as a defect in the final product and we also have to face the connection, how we, have, we can connect this printed electronic to conventional um, electronics. And final, the functional validation, the characterization, and for that purpose, may I, may I move to the, to the examples. The first one developed, as I said before, in an uh, in-move project. Uh, this is the first application I want to, to move. Uh, we have here a uh, the platform of the drone and we use a screen printing in, the, in that case to um, to print the wiring oh, it's not uh, yeah so we do some registration in the printing machine we establish the pressure and the um, the height of the printing to achieve the uh, correct width of the of the printing and at the end we what we get is this wiring and and the result that was the drone was flying with this printed path. Uh, this work has been developed in the frame of Inmove project. It's a Cerbera um, platform in which Catec, uh, uh, ICEA, the School of Engineering of the University of Seville and the Technological Institute of, of Galicia are also participating with, together with us. Uh, another example is the integration of a heater in a car door. It's true, it's where it was for automotive sector, but can be applied also for anti-aging or whatever in, auto, in aeronautic sectors. Uh, one of the challenges in the project here that was financed by the Navarro government was the printing on the fabric and, and, the, fab and the later fabrication, but we were testing different substrates and finally we printed on a uh, glass fiber um, textile or, and we introduced it in the final composite, proving that it was correctly insulated by uh, the electrical layer and with a, th thermo a, camera, a thermographic camera we proved that it was possible to, to heat. Uh, here in the image we have the complete door. Uh, first, as I said, the printed layer, the insulation, integration and later evaluation. 
Another example of the integration uh, that we are working is in the integration of antennas in the car. Here we have a rear view. Uh, this work was uh, developed in the Voltage project, also financed by the government of Navarra. Uh, we work on the integration of different types of antennas embedded in the composites, and they are being evaluated uh, um, for various applications in the mobility and other sectors. One of the examples is uh, so. One of the ca uh, characterization is shown in the second image. We have we can see there the signal at nine megahertz. And okay, we can, as I, you may know more than me, uh, do some uh, identification of the different uh, vehicles by the integration of these antennas in the in the in the mobiles. Connectivity is a very fashionable topic, uh, not only in the automotive sector but also in the aeronautical sector. And proof of this is the last portfolios launched, for example, by Torai, uh, in which materials are presented to avoid uh, ceiling and allow connectivity in different frequency and it is important also for the printed electronics in composite to, to use this different material that Tora is presenting. Uh, the third example uh, I wanted to present is uh, this one in which we develop a strain gauges, we printed strain gauges that we uh, introduced in, uh, in in uh, an aerospace application, it was developed under in the frame of Epcom project, in which also uh, Microlan was involved together with Compositador. Um, and we, in this project, we evaluate the influence of uh, using different substrates, papers, or plastics in the evaluation of uh, uh, how they can affect. Uh, in the in, in the mechanical properties of the of the component of the structural properties and and at the end we we, f we find a feasible de design of the strain gauges. Uh, we proved that papers wa it was a very very useful uh, substrate to be integrated in the in the composite materials. We prove the manufacturing process. We define the materials to 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 generate these strain gauges and to intro introduce them in the composite and to monitor the structural health of the of the components. After sewing the process, materials, and also some of the samples in which we have been working on, uh, it's time to to go to the conclusion. And here I wanted to to highlight. The, the range of opportunities that the integration of printed electronics uh, in composite offer to different sectors. Uh, as I mentioned before, it's a low-cost production in which uh, that allow us to 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 confer lightness, to, to reduce the weight and also to add new functionalities and not only in aeronautics but also in energy, automotion or whatever. So the, the, the technology is there, the possibility is there, so we have to explode it, we have to think about possible application, some of the examples are shown but uh, our mind has to work <laughs> on that and, and maybe we find more application useful for this sector. Thank you very much for all of you, for your time. And of course, any questions you have will be more than welcome. And if you don't have questions, of course, <laughs> your interest or your possibilities of application will be also uh, welcome. Thank you to all of you. Thank you very much, Ursula. Uh, well, I, I think it's getting quite natural here in English. It's a, uh, an R and D project, so we can we can talk in English. It's, it's quite natural, and your level is so super good, and so we can continue like that. Uh, well, this is the agenda. We've we've been listening to Nitech. Now it's the turn of Valiant Tens. 
validación de la fabricación aditiva en trans por aplicaciones espaciales, that, that is to say, validation of the additive manufacturing of antennas for spatial applications. Now is uh, Marta, who is going to conduct the, the presentation. Uh, Marta, come, come on, come on, come on, come on, go and see the, Dan. Marta is from Anteral, the leader of the consortium. Uh, they are a SME specialized in the design and manufacturing of antennas, mainly for space or for, for any kind of uh, sectors. <coughs> in this case, it's for space. Okay, and then Nitec is already there. Tasio, they, they, you know by far what are they doing, what are they doing? Uh, mechatronics, mobility, and everything. Now, Marta, sit down, please. Yeah. <laughs> now, Lisi, uh, Sebastian. Well, Lisi is the Lisi Aerospace Additive Manufacturing. I think is the business unit for additive manufacturing for Lisi uh, uh, Lisi Aerospace Group. It's a big group there in France. In France, Microlan Aitor is a, an SME specialized in, in machining. They manufacture components and, and everything for any kind of sector. Okay. And I left one, CDA, Joseba. CDA is a specialized uh, technological center in the Basque country, specialized in other areas because they, they do a lot of things, but they are specialized in this, in this case about testing. Okay. They do. Uh, Aeronautic testing, space testing, everything. So, uh, well, uh, I think Marta is going to conduct everything. You've got here your. Okay. It's a, it's a, let me say that it's a strong group, and I think it's a, with a, a lot of future. Okay, nine, nine is Novela Quitan Euskadi Navarra. As you can see, there is the framework that they, they are financing, co financing this project. I think we, we have a very, I don't know, but I think it's collaborative, complementary, and with all the future, as I said. Okay, Marta, it's your turn. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, hello, everybody. And um, first of all, thank you for being here. And uh, sorry for my voice. I'm going to try to do my best, but it's a little bad today. Uh, we are going to uh, summarize the steps and the goals, the main goals of the Valid Antennes project. Um, okay, uh, starting with a, a small or brief introduction, um, with the arrival of the new space sector, the space sector has changed uh, completely because traditionally the space technology was large and really expensive. Um, accessible only for major corporations or space agencies. But uh, nowadays, uh, this space sector is focused on developing small, smaller and uh, lighter satellites, uh, both uh, to reduce the weight and uh, therefore the cost of the space components. So many small companies are uh, working on this sector, uh, which traditionally was like uh, focused on, on big companies. Um, the, yeah, the main line of this new space sector is reducing the time of uh, design of the satellites. So we can uh, design like um, more satellites, lighter, so we can uh, reduce the cost because of the, the, the cost of uh, each gram launched to the space. So uh, in this project, uh, we are going to study and validate additive manufacturing technologies for antennas for space applications, specifically for small satellites uh, for new space. So uh, to make a further study, we are going to make a comparison between two radiant chains uh, which are which have been designed for uh, for uh, being manufactured both through CNC uh, conventional techniques and SLM uh, that is one of the additive manufacturing uh, techniques. Um, additive manufacturing is becoming increasingly important in the space sector because it allows uh, flexible designs, so we can reduce the weight and therefore the cost. Uh, the stages or the phase of the project 
um, was the design, where well, sorry, the design, the electromagnetic uh, or radio frequency design of the radiant chains, then the finite element simulation, the manufacturing both through conventional and additive technologies, the metallographic test, the electromagnetic test, and finally the <coughs> the environmental uh, testing, um, both uh, t uh, vibration, sorry, and thermal cycling, and finally the conclusions. So um, I'm going to start with Anteral. Anteral is an spin-off of the Palvin University of Navarre, founded in 2000, so two, yes, 2010 uh, by the Antenna Research Group of the same university. We develop antenna passives and radar technology uh, for many sectors like telecommunication, space, <coughs> uh, industry, academia, smart cities, and, uh, and so on. So uh, on the one hand, in our antennas and passive uh, development line, we have uh, many different uh, radio frequency products. Um, for example, any kind of antennas, planar, uh, corrugated horns, splines, um, proofs, and so on, and um, many different kinds of passives, polarizers, filters, ortho modes, uh, and yeah, many different kinds. Um, we have both codes uh, or a standard product and also ad hoc design. And in this line, uh, we have like more than 12 years of heritage and within the space uh, sector, uh, we have participated in more than uh, 14 uh, space programs, international space programs. We work with major companies around the world like Airbus, Thales, the European Space Agency, NASA, JPL, uh, and etc. And on the other hand, in our radar uh, development line, um, we are focused on boosting innovative solutions um, in order to um, make radar technology accessible for everyone. Um, and we have also a standard products and ad hoc design. So our main task was the electromagnetic design of the radiant chains and then the electromagnetic or the radio frequency measurements. So uh, as you can see here in the, in the image, um, both radiant chains have uh, the same antenna for both uh, CNC and SLM manufacturing, but the polarizer is different. The main difference between the designs is that um, the additive manufacturing chain is manufactured in one single piece, as you can see here, uh, while the CNC uh, uh, fit chain um, is made up of two parts, two different parts. Uh, so we have um, to add screws and flanges uh, to connect the, the components. So uh, as I have said, the antenna will be the same, but the polarizer will be different, but quite similar because the, uh, the design was um, the same, adapted with adapted geometry, interior geometry, depending on uh, the manufacturing techniques in order to um, take the most of the benefits uh, that uh, these technologies uh, give us. So yeah, uh, starting with uh, the <coughs> specifications, the electromagnetic specifications, the frequency band chosen was the KKA frequency band, uh, widely used in satellite communications. We have both uplink and doublink uh, um, uh, bands. Um, more specifically, the return losses that we uh, need are higher than 18 dBs. The insertion losses must be less than 0.3 dBs, and we need an isolation of more than 20 dBs. Um, on the other hand, the directivity must be higher than 18 uh, dBs, and the axial ratio less than 1 dB. This uh, the axial ratio is a very important parameter in this kind of designs because it tells us about how good is the circular polarization. Uh, so we, our goal was 1 dB, but um, we tried to do our best here. 
and uh, talking about the mechanical specifications, the length uh, that we need or yeah we need uh, was uh, less or equal to uh, 200 millimeters because in the new space sector and small satellites uh, all components are um, yeah. We, uh, the space is uh, very reduced, so we need uh, less length than in conventional satellites. Um, talking about the electromagnetic results, uh, we can see here the return losses, the isolation, and the directivity. Um, both designs, the CNC and the um, uh, manufacturing designs, are quite similar in simulation because they are like the same but with these geometric uh, modifications, but the results are quite similar. So we can see here that re return loss achieved are uh, m around uh, 20, 25 uh, dBs in not only both uh, the, in the interest bands, uh, uplink and downlink that are uh, shown here with boxes, uh, but also in the whole band, so quite good. The isolation is also uh, uh, within the specifications, and the directivity is higher than the 18 dBs. Uh, on the other hand, the axial ratio here is uh, great, is um, around uh, 0.5 dBs. And if you uh, remember, the specifications was 1 dB, so we have achieved uh, mm, less than uh, the middle, so OK. And uh, here we have also the radio, <coughs> the far field radiation patterns at uh, one frequency in the lower band and other in the upper band. So, yeah, thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, you already know NITEC, and Usua has already <coughs> given a uh, detailed uh, description of uh, who we are. But uh, nevertheless, I'm going to go through several points that she has not mentioned. Uh, well, we like to describe uh, ourselves as a technological center that provides solutions to companies in order to develop more competitive and sustainable products and processes. Uh, <clears throat> we have three main uh, work lines, and those are mobility, uh, understood as the autonomous and connected vehicle, uh, and also the sustainable mobility. Also, uh, the mechatronic field, uh, in which we perform activities such as the advanced mechatronic and product development, uh, digital transformation of industrial processes, and also, of course, printed electronics. <laughs> and finally, we have the, the, valu the validation field, in which uh, we do product testing and validation, and also the sustainability analysis of different parts and components. Uh, said so, um, I'm going to uh, go through the, the task that NITEC has performed uh, within this project. The first one is the structural analysis, uh, and the second one is the metallographic analysis of, the, uh, of these pieces that we have manufactured. I'm going to start with the first one, uh, which is the structural analysis. Well, here the, 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 moin, the main point is to, is to know whether these parts are going to, to stand uh, the, the different loads that the specimen uh, is subjected to. Uh, so therefore, we have built a model, and we tried to build it as representa uh, representative to the reality as possible. Uh, here, what you see uh, on the left part of the, of the slide is uh, how the model looks like. And also, we introduce, uh, indeed, the accelero accelerometer that is placed during the, the test performed in the city fac facilities uh, to, to have the, uh, let's say, the most realistic answer as possible. Uh, once we have built the model, the first part is to perform a model analysis. This is uh, find the, the frequencies at which uh, this specimen uh, could uh, enter in resonance, for example, and uh, check uh, which is the, the equivalent mass uh, distributed uh, in each of those frequencies. This is to have an idea if we are in danger or not uh, when we perform these, this test 
this testing. Uh, and, and as we will see later, this was helpful. Then, uh, then we, we have introduced s different types of loads. Uh, these are the three main loads that the antenna uh, can be subjected to uh, when, when mounted. The first one is a quasi-static load. The second one, a sign load. And the third one, a random load. Uh, we analyzed for each of those uh, load types uh, which stresses uh, were, was the, the, the antenna uh, being subjected to. And also, as we had placed a, let's say, um, a virtual uh, accelerometer on the model, we acquired the acceleration at that point, and that was uh, the, uh, the key point to correlate with the, with the test results. And that's what you can see on the left, uh, on the right part of the slide. Uh, I don't know if you are going to be able to distinguish between the two lines, but one of those is the, um, the accelerations obtained uh, in this virtual accelerometer in the model, and the other one is the real acceleration uh, uh, obtained in the, in the experimental test. As you can see, they are quite similar. Indeed, the width of, of this peak is similar. That's informing us that, the, for example, the damping that we, we have given to the, to the model is quite right. And I, I have to, to remark here that this was not a straightforward process. We had to iterate, uh, changing several points. For example, the, the wall thickness of the model at several points, because we saw that the, the, in reality, the, the thickness of each part was not the same as in the model. But with those uh, small modifications, we were able to, to acquire uh, good results. And, and this was very useful, because uh, when we introduced the random load, we saw that the specimen uh, was being subjected to uh, quite dangerous uh, stresses. So we could act be, uh, before uh, breaking all the specimens, for example. And the last chart is uh, a comparison of the accelerations. Um, this is a, just an example of one of the loads. Uh, that one is a, a, a sign load. And you can see as well how the, the, accelera the accelerations meet uh, uh, with the with analytical ones. Thank you. So um, I'm part of uh, Lizzie Aerospace IT Manufacturing. So Lizzie Aerospace IT Manufacturing is uh, an SME, part of a uh, French Lizzie Group. Uh, we are a leading company in metallic additive manufacturing for aeronautics, space, and defense activity. And we are at the beginning, so we work with customer for workshop, co-design and simulation, and we deliver the finished part. So you can see that we are focusing on these five steps, workshop, co-design and simulation, raw material uh, control and inspection, fusion, of course, part finishing, and final inspection. And you can see some pictures of um, our facility. On the left, uh, one of our largest additive manufacturing machine to produce very large parts for aeronautic and space activities. In the middle, you can see finishing operation when we remove support on the part. And on the right, you can see our laboratory to inspect um, metallographic uh, analysis and tensile test of our samples. And we are working for major aeronautic and space companies in Europe, so with uh, Thales, Airbus, Iron Group, Dassault, uh, Safran. So in this project, we were in charge of manufacturing, the additive manufacturing parts. So we manufacture the part in um, aluminium uh, with, uh, after discussion with uh, Anteral. We decided to manufacture this part on our machine EOS M219, one of our smallest machines, but uh, this machine can manufacture very thin walls. So it was very interesting in this project. We, in one manufacturing batch, we produced uh, different parts, you can see on the pictures. So we produced the part uh, that was presented, and the complete part, but we also produced the part in two parts, on, uh, on the left, um, because we wanted to see if we have some difference between a complete part in just one part, or two parts separated and uh, assembly together. After manufacturing, we had some post-treatment operation with heat treatment, uh, we need to remove support structures to finish surfaces. 
and so we add after that dimensional inspection with CMM inspection. We have machining operation and the final inspection operation <laughs> thanks to CT scan. And so we were able to deliver this part to Anteral. Thank you. Hello. Uh, I am Maitor Echeverria, uh, the manager of Microlan Aerospace. Microlan Aerospace is a company founded in uh, 2004. In 2005, we obtained uh, ISO 9001 certification, and in 2010, we obtained uh, the ISO 9100 certification. Currently, we form a young, mixed, and involved team of 45 people. Uh, since 2017, we are part of the BASP uh, Aeronautical Cluster EGAN, and we work for different sectors such as aeronautics, space, research, renewable energies, capital goods, and automotive. Our motto is passion for precision, and our objectives and our quality and service to our customers. Being the trusted resource for the most critical works is what drives us to be better every day. And in this project, our participation is not very good, uh, very big. Sorry, uh, our participation has been based uh, on manufacturing different parts by machining. First, uh, we have torn a horn. Uh, you can see in the beach, uh, in a multitasking machine. Um, we have also milled pa different parts uh, that we have later assembled with commercial parts for uh, to form the filter. And finally, uh, we have measured both the separate parts and the assembly on a CMM to ensure that everything fits as planned. Um, we have done uh, seven projects with valid antennas, uh, ID, I plus D plus I projects, and it has been a pleasure to participate in this project, and hopefully we will continue to work together in the future. Thank you. Okay, yes. Uh, no, nothing's not fine. <laughs> well, I think this uh, slide is here because uh, we wanted to, to remark that we had done the metallographic uh, test just after the, the, the specimen was uh, manufactured. And um, quite, uh, we have uh, here like three or four remarks uh, about the metallographic test. Uh, spoiler: the results are really good. Uh, <laughs> we did we did uh, an analysis of how the the welding passes uh, were performed. This is uh, how well the different layers of materials are uh, stick and glued together. And uh, what we did was an, an analysis of uh, some flaws and imperfections that we can find uh, in the in the specimen such as voids you can see one uh, on the top on the bottom part of the slide uh, accumulus which is some uh, trapped uh, materials inside inside the core part of the of the specimen and finally uh, if there are uh, any lacks of internal uh, fusion uh, within the, the specimen as well uh, the, the thing is that when when we did the, the macrogra macrographic analysis, uh, we didn't see any uh, metallurgical, uh, let, let's say, failure. And when we did the, this, uh, this analysis in detail, uh, only 0.2% uh, of, um, of defects were found uh, within the whole specimen, which is a really, really good uh, result. That's from my side.
Hello again. <laughs> I'm going to talk about the radio frequency measurement. Uh, let's start with the CNC um, manufacturing fit chain. Um, talking about the actual radio, uh, here uh, we can see that the result is around 0 0.5 dB, which is quite similar indeed to the simulations, so it's a great value. And the directivity is also um, higher than 17 uh, dB, which are our goal. Here we have the radiation pattern, um, uh, both in the lower and the upper bands. Uh, we can see that uh, the cross polar level is quite good. The cross polar level is uh, at zero deg in theta, uh, and it's related to the axial ratio values. So we can see that in, uh, for example, 19.45 gigahertz, the cross polar level is really, uh, really low and it's related to the axial ratio because we can see that in this frequency or at this frequency, uh, the axial ratio value is really close to zero. Uh, and this is why in the, in the other radiation pattern, the cross polar level is higher because it not uh, fit the other zero, but it's quite good because uh, it's around uh, 35, uh, 40 uh, dB, so it's quite good. Uh, here we have, on the other hand, the AM uh, fit chain. So the results are less than 1 dB, that was our specification, but, but is higher than the CNC manufacturing uh, chain. <clears throat> Although it's higher, it's also a, a quite good uh, result because it not only uh, ha less than one dB in the both interest band, but also in the whole uh, in the whole frequency band from 18 to 31.5. So it's uh, quite awesome. The directivity is uh, the sim very similar to the to the CNC um, measurement, and it's also higher than the specification. So quite good. Here we have the other uh, radio. Radio, uh, <coughs> sorry, radio frequency um, far field radiation patterns at both uh, frequency bands, and the the results are also quite good. Um, okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Joshua Iza. I'm the commercial responsible of system and space testing area at CTA. CTA is an aerospace testing laboratory specialized in testing for development and certification of aerospace material structures and, and systems with high research and development activity. Uh, the main activities of uh, CTA include structural testing, system testing, space testing, where we perform Test for uh, the main companies at Spain, uh, Crisa, uh, Thales, Iberespacio, but also for small companies like uh, Atlantis, UARS. So we test for for all, almost all the companies at, Sp uh, at Spain. In this project, in the Valida Antennas project, we have carried out the the, the test, the different tests. Uh, vibration and shock test, and also thermal cycling test that has been explained um, previously by, by NITEC. Here, indeed, in this slide, you can see one image of each test performed during the test campaign. The first uh, image shows the, the vibration test performed. In this case, both antennas were tested at the same time. Uh, using a test feature the designed by CTA. The three axes of the, of the antennas were tested uh, with the uh, shaker in vertical configuration uh, using this feature. And as NITEC has told, uh, we tested different loads during, during the vibration campaign, quasi-static uh, quasi static loads, uh, sign loads, and, and random loads. Here you can see the different levels applied in each, in each case. Maybe you can see in the picture the, the accelerometer located uh, uh, on, the, on, the, on each antenna. 
these measurements uh, were used by NITEC then to correlate their, their uh, finite element models to adjust the, the models. So the results were, were okay. So we continued with the, with the net test, which was the pyroshock test. In this case, uh, the antennas were tested separately. We use our uh, a pyroshock test bench developed by CTA. It is based on a resonant plate where we impact with a powder nail gun. Uh, we impact in one corner of the resonant plate and the shock wave is transmitted through the resonant plate to the, to the specimen that is mounted in a, an interface plate. Uh, like in the vibration test, we we put some accelerometers on the on the antenna, and, and in this case, we we were able to test the three axes of the of the antenna, with only one configuration. And the last test that we performed was the thermocycling test. The, in this case, both antennas were tested at the same time, and they were mounted in our climatic chamber. This chamber works with liquid nitrogen, so we generate a, an inert environment around the antennas to protect them. In this case, we perform 10, 10 cycles between the temperatures that are indicated, minus 40 and plus uh, 95 degrees. And after mm, this test, we perform, like in the shock test that I haven't said, a resonant search in order to detect if the if there were any damage in the in the in the antennas we we compare the the resonance frequency obtained before and after the test and we show that the the results were the same so it was no no defect and the last one oh, sorry and here you can see the results obtained in each of the tests. The first one is the vibration test, the resonance search, where you can see the resonance frequency of one of the accelerometers, the, the peak is at I know, 300 hertz. And the second one is the SRS results obtained during shock test, and, and the last one is the, the results obtained during the thermocycling test with the thermocouples located on the, on the antennas. So uh, thank you to all the partners and we are going to summarize the conclusions and the final results. Talking about the electromagnetic results, the reactivity and the cross polarizations are uh, quite similar uh, or identical results and the far field results are also uh, quite uh, identical. But the actual ratio uh, has the slight has a slight difference uh, because the CNC uh, worst case was 0 0.6 dBs, uh, while the AM worst case was 0 0.8, but uh, the difference is uh, really low, so uh, both results meet the specifications of less than 1 dB. Um, talking about the weight of the change, that it's a quite important and interesting parameter, the AM uh, weight was 93 uh, grams, uh, while the CNC weight was uh, 192. If we see the uh, manufactured parts, we can see that the SLM part, that is this one, uh, is made up on one single piece, uh, while the other one is made up two parts, and we have flanges and screws uh, in the CNC manufacturing. So this is why the weight is higher, because we have to take into account the weight of these uh, components. And also it's cut uh, in different parts, the polarizer, because the antenna, you can see that is the same. So all in all, the comparison and the conclusions uh, the important conclusions for me is that um, AM manufacturing is becoming increasingly important, but we have to take into account that we are working here around uh, 30, uh, 30 gigahertz. So uh, 
the results here are quite promising um, compar in comparison with the CNC manufacturing uh, chain, but uh, AM has to um, develop more uh, in order to um, be able to use this kind of technologies at higher frequency, for example, 200 gigahertz or something like that. But in this case, uh, the two models have been, um, have been manufacturing uh, properly and the final test has undergone the environmental test, the metrallographic test, and so on. And all the results are quite good. Uh, both designs meet the specifications. Uh, and as, uh, as I have said, sorry, the AM uh, fit chain is 50% uh, lightweight than the CNC one. But, but uh, two, the two fit chains are quite good. So uh, the results, uh, we have to be happy, but because the results were quite good. Uh, we have presented these results recently in the fourth uh, engineering congress uh, of, uh, of Spain in Madrid. Uh, and that's all. If you have some questions, uh, we will be happy to answer you. So thank you. Yes, any questions? I've got a micro, so no questions. No questions. May I ask one? Okay, Anteral, uh, is it possible to offer a product development in additive manufacturing to the market in, in a short term? I mean, yeah. this, is, this is something that proves that your product is, is feasible to, to sell it to, for example, Senado, that it's here. Yeah, as I have said, all the results were quite good, not only uh, talking to uh, electromagnetic design, but also in the other uh, tests. So this project was really interesting for us because we see that real uh, AM manufacturing is something that uh, is going to be very important in next years uh, within the aerospace sector. Uh, because the light, uh, the weight, sorry, uh, achieved are awesome the, in the parts. So without a doubt, uh, these parts can be sold uh, to the commercial market. So yeah. So, okay, that's that's a good point because all of the R and D projects are supposed to be made to commercialize in the short term a product, not just to put it in a library. Oh, it's a good project here. Okay. Well, and that's a question for you, Lisi. Is the additive manufacturing technology ready for bigger ones or, or more or more uh, complex ones? Or no? Yes, we are today. We are manufacturing part up to 800 millimeters, so we can think about manufacturing many parts together with um, more complex uh, shapes inside the part. But the um, question would be how to inspect it and uh, what would be the specification of such parts. Uh, are you uh, uh, are you uh, have you got a fear for for AD additive manufacturing, or do you think the CNC continue continue a, a, a good technology for for space? And no, I think that I certainly believe that these two technologies will go hand in hand in the future, and will offer us very important synergies to increase the current capabilities and. So the two they consider. are <laughs> need to yes. or technology synergistic. Yeah. See, I, I was wondering uh, what are the peculiarities of the space testing. I mean, are they the same environmental conditions in space, or just uh, we try to simulate them. So the difference. Uh, yes, we try to simulate them. In not uh, they are not the same exactly, but we try to simulate them with in a control. Uh, in a laboratory in controlled environment, and yes, that is the idea. Okay, thanks. Night deck. I don't have a question for you because you have uh, all the graphics and so on. Uh, I don't know if you want to to highlight something or to emphasize in something. Well, uh, I think that it could be highlighted that uh, there are some doubts about uh, additive manufacturing sometimes, and well, uh, our. Uh, 
analysis, well, our mental graphic analysis, just uh, told us that uh, these parts can be as useful as the uh, conventional conventional ones. No major defects were found, and the percentage of uh, of defects uh, were, uh, was really low. So. In general, I, I would say that's a positive point, like a, a good result. Yeah. And Martin, I want to add <laughs> that Lisi, because I forgot to say, uh, Lisi give us uh, many different parts, and these results are uh, for the best uh, part, the best fit chain. But other fit chains, uh, the perform was not uh, quite good. Uh, in comparison with the, with that, and this is why uh, we used a different surface treatment, and depending on the surface treatment used, the results uh, vary. So uh, it's something that we have uh, to study because these results are without any uh, post-processing. That is quite interesting because we thought that the post-processing uh, will improve uh, would improve the performance, but not so. Uh, these results uh, have to say it. Yes. Thank you very much. Well, uh, there's a question here. What kind of uh, surface treatments uh, uh, do you use in in the AIF uh, parts? We, we tried different surface treatment. We had uh, mechanical, chemical uh, surface treatment on the part. Um, maybe we can say what is the best one uh, surface treatment we use. In this case, no one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So because we'll because it affects to the tolerances of the parts. So uh, maybe they reduce the roughness of the pieces, but they so we have like holes in the piece. So the total tolerance uh, was um, bad in comparison without the roughness, the real roughness of the, of the fit chain. So in this case, no one <laughs> was the best result. In general way, we, we ask our customer to find the good tolerances of roughness because most of our customers want uh, roughness under three microns, for example. But we, we ask them if they really need this uh, rootness under three microns because it's very difficult in the manufacturing to achieve stuff rootness. And so that's why we, we perform different um, parts with and without surface treatment. And uh, so we, we said maybe without surface treatment it will be, will be good, so we have to try. And so we tried and uh, we have these results. Yeah, because the tolerances of in this case was all oh, the goal tolerances was uh, less than 20 microns, so it's quite low. <laughs> We've got another question here. Uh, you have said that the tolerances were uh, less than 20 microns, but the goal, the goal. Our yes, goal. but which were the real tolerances? Because you have done a, a control of tolerances after, uh, is, is what I uh, have understood. In this case, uh, in the CNC uh, manufacturing process, the tolerances was lower uh, than the, the 20 uh, microns. Yes. In the AM uh, case, what high was was yeah, were higher, but uh, we have performed uh, a tolerance analysis. Uh, within the first stage of the project, so our designs are um, quite hard. Uh, so they also uh, perform well. Uh, yes, with the out tolerances. Of, out of the tolerances, yes. And uh, but the, the number I didn't remember. I I don't know if uh, you remember now. <laughs> I uh, no, I, don't I don't have remember. the number in my mind now. But higher, I I think around 50, 80. Microns. I think, yeah, in uh, the best case. But I don't have the, the name now, so the number now, sorry. Yes, and uh, what about the deformations? I mean, uh, if uh, there is a shrinkage after you print the, the, the item, there is a change after, the, after you print it. Because sometimes when you print something, then there is a, uh, after the time pass, uh, passes, there is a change in that, in the, in, the, in, in the tolerances or there's deformations, these kind of things. Which is your experience? 
we, we perform the specific heat treatment after manufacturing to avoid this deformation time after uh -huh, time. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Okay. And so that's why we, we had no deformation after uh, one, uh, one year or two years. Mm -hmm. And which kind of material have, we, have you used for the... Uh, we use aluminium. Aluminium. Aluminium, uh, AS7 uh, aluminium. So uh, very generic aluminium in additive manufacturing. Mm -hmm. With no treatment, no further treatment on that? On the material? Yes. No, just an end treatment after manufacturing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, no more questions? No more questions. Well, we are going to end uh, the session. I think it's, well, <coughs> I think the, we've got uh, here in the Ruth region, uh, the south of the Atlantic Basin, we've got a complete and capable and synergistic ecosystem that, that would allow us to be a world-class leader in the aeronautics. I mean, with Nouvelle Aquitaine, with Navarra, with Euskadi, I think we've got a, a lot of future in this sector. Uh, thanks, uh, everyone, for coming. Uh, thanks for the partners to come here with, with us. And thanks to Nine, to the Euroregion. If, if you want to say something later, because the, uh, the, the person in charge of well, the region. Well, <laughs> in, charge, in charge of the call for projects. So. Okay, maybe, I don't know if she's here better. So, well, I just wanted to thank everyone for coming, and especially the partners, because for us it's really important to continue to support these kind of projects that build relationships that can be used as a leverage effect to position ourselves, to position the Euro region. So as you all maybe don't know, the Euro region is an European grouping for co territorial cooperation between the government of Nouvelle Aquitaine, the government of the Basque Country, and the government of Navarra. Uh, we launch every year a call for projects in September in what we consider are the strategic sector that are common to the three territories. So for us it's aeronautics, additive manufacturing, energy, health, agriculture, uh, sustainable construction, and now I and the new one that we will be launching in September that's uh, creative industries. So for us, the goal is like to develop the partnership to, as I say, create EU regional value chains to build trust among partners. And I think one of the best examples is this project that we have already. <laughs> That's like a continuation of other projects that have been built. And we can see that how it works, how the connections are built, how we can start to see a Euro regional value chain in this sector and how we can position ourselves. So thank you everyone and it's like we'll be launching a new call for projects in September. Well, it's finished. Thanks everyone. Yeah. And we've got a little snack there so we can continue talking. Okay? Thank you.